educate our children and youth so that they can think independently. Time has undoubtedly changed. We live in the information age, where knowledge is just a few steps away from us, which only requires someone to have that hunger for constant growth, learning, and exploration. As engineering students, our basic foundation of education is learning technology and thinking creatively to find effective solutions to solve real life problems, and also keep evolving as the technology advances. Technology has the potential to upskill our lives, innovate the unexplored, and most importantly, give rise to entrepreneurship in India. A very good morning to one and all present here. This is Sudanshu. And I'm Ratnakshi. And we both welcome you to the auspicious occasion of VES Technology Day for the dialogue session, TRL 0 to Global IT Hub, the story of India's rise from a Mavericks fight. Our nation, India, is undoubtedly one of the fastest economically and technologically growing nation, and its advances are blooming in each sector. From the birth of ISRO in 1962 to the successful test of Pokhran, India has come a long way battle with all forms of odds and has successfully built skilled entrepreneurs who had glorified the name of our country globally. Vesit had always stood as a backbone to help the students to focus on innovation and build the mindset to turn ideas into reality. The startup ecosystem has been the building block for innovation and technologies. We surely agree, yes, the Shark Tank India has influenced the youth to enter into this industry but the one who truly has a passion for innovation and learning new advanced technology will only hit the bullseye and make the crazy ideas turn into reality. We need more innovations like WhatsApp and Instagram from India. The youth must focus on original ideas which are yet to be explored and work on them. On behalf of Vesit Isel, we would like to welcome Sri Harish Mehta, founder of executive chairman of On Onboard Technologies Limited and Sri Vijay Talreja, member managing committee, VES. Now, I would like to request principal ma'am to kindly introduce and deliver the welcome address. Please ma'am. Good morning, one and all. You took time to assemble in the event, to, to, the, in the, to, uh, to come to the auditorium. But you should be participating actively in the, this event because this is a very, very, very rare occasion you will be getting to interact with a very senior visionary. I feel very happy and privileged to welcome and introduce our eminent speaker we have today, Sri Harish Mehta, founder and executive chairman of Onward Technologies Limited. He is also the founding member and first elected, selected chairman of NASCOM, National Association of Software and Service Companies. Seeded in 1988, NASCOM created a trusted environment where competing companies could collaborate with each other towards a larger objective of building India as a trusted destination for software service business. They crafted core institutional values in the early days itself, which helped them to stay together as a cohesive unit. The institutional values of no personal agenda, collaborate and compete and focus on growth should be adopted by all such organizations. The co-opetition model, com cooperation among competitors, facilitated them to present unique India-first voice to the policymakers. These values help them to navigate the crisis which of uh, Satyam scandal which happened in 2009. NASCOM's handling of Satyam crisis is a phenomenal case study. And it demonstrated that values like no personal agenda and collaborate to compete were not hollow phrases, but the principles that NASCOM live, live by. It was a triumph of collective 
proactive action taken by industry to protect its image. It greatly enhanced Indian IT stature within country and overseas. No wonder our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi remarked, when the chips were down, your codes kept things running. And he described NASCOM as a movement and not as a simple association. He committed, he commented on another occasion, Mujhe lagta tha, desh ki chinta hum politicians ko hoti hai. Yahan to NASCOM walon ko bhi utni hi chinta hai. Am I right, sir? Dear students, we are really lucky to listen to the visionary Sri Harish Mehta, one of the mavericks who seeded the idea of NASCOM in 1988. At NASCOM, sir is now the convener of Chairperson's Council, and his leadership saw the team seeding several initiatives that helped propel NASCOM's vision further. These include working towards a robust brand India, laying the foundation of software technology parks, export processing zones, framing of stringent policies for copyright laws to control software piracy, and creation of India's first cyber hub. Sirs, owns a company called Onward Technologies, which is a publicly listed company focused on engineering and software services and currently employs more than 2,500 employees. Apart from his work at Onward and NASCOM, he is passionate about injecting a scientific mindset in India and encouraging innovation-driven entrepreneurship. He believes that innovation-driven entrepreneurship will act as change agents for the upliftment of society. He is also an active angel investor and brought Thai, the Indus in the entrepreneurs, the Indus entrepreneurs, a Silicon Valley-based not-for-profit organization in 1999 to India and was the first president of Thai Mumbai. He is founding member of Infinity Venture Fund set up in 2002 as India's first corporate VC fund. He is also an investment committee member at the Indian Angel Network. Sir holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from COEP Pune and master's in computer science from Brooklyn Polytechnic, New York. He returned to India after six successful years of career in USA. Sir has authored a book, The Maverick Effect, The Inside Story of India's IT Revolution, which you can see over here in 2022. As a startup system transitions to scaling up, this book on extraordinary journey of Indian science industry is, will certainly prove to be a Bible to many of them. I, I, I started reading the book Saturday afternoon, and I did not keep it down till I completed it. I recommend all, all of you to read that. The, having the, this core principle should be embedded in everyone's mindset so that you can grow your organization tomorrow. With this, I would like to also welcome Sri Vidya Chalreja, our own alumnus and uh, various managing committee member. Vikran Joshi is a principal based polytechnic and members from Thai, uh, Thai Shapnam executive director Nali to the function. Thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs> now we'll, I will hand over the session to Vijay Taldeja to further proceed. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Okay, let's understand the demographic of this audience. Uh, of course, there is a very good mix of diversity here. And this is something that I love when I come to an institution, right? It's very rare to see that kind of a diversity when we go back to our industry. So how many of you all are from the first year engineering batch? How many of your second year rights? Lovely. Third year, very good. Fourth year, I don't, oh, lovely. I am surprised you guys are here. <laughs> because I rarely see the fourth year, right? I mean, they are generally out for internship or uh, okay. hunting for, you know, uh, projects. 
So great. Uh, welcome everyone. I would like to again take this opportunity to welcome, uh, I call him Harish Bhai. I mean, this is how we fondly call him. So I'm a little hesitant to say Harish Bhai, but welcome Harish Bhai. It is a pleasure to have you here and a round of applause for Harish Bhai. So Harish Bhai, I would like to start to just start with giving a quick introduction about uh, Vivekananda Education Society uh, and, in this, uh, and in this college where we are here. So Vivekananda Education Society, as I was telling you earlier, right, we have about 20,000 students who are across schools, um, junior colleges, engineering college where we are here today, the architecture college is next door the pharmacy college which is opposite, the management college. Loud yeah, you can hear me, right? Raise your hand if you don't. So, uh, in the campus where we are sitting, there's, there's a lot of uh, sweat that has gone by honorary trustees and our staff members to build this campus. And also, given the fact that as members of VS, we have tried to bring the industry closer, it has helped us evolve to an extent that today we are, we, we very proudly say that every student that graduates from Vivekananda Education Society is ready for the industry. Right? Am I, am I right? Do you all agree? Good. Right? From an industry perspective, we will still keep complaining that, you know, there is still a divide. But I think that's also because technology is evolving very fast. So I think there's definitely always a catch up to do. So from a Vivekananda Education Society perspective, I think there's, there's a long journey that we've crossed. And clearly I can relate how you've done this in NASCOM in the IT industry. And I would love to hear how, what motivated you to write this book and hear from your, uh, from your perspective, what made you get started as a industry association and how did you really evolve into NASCOM? And I think today, all these young bright minds who are the future engineers should definitely get inspired from what you've achieved and as an institution, what you've really established. Harish Bhai, what I think Vijay, your question is, has so many questions inside. Answer would be read the book. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I'm thankful to Vivekananda partly because our Europe, our US head, Pratish Mehta, uh, graduated from Vivekananda. So thank you all. So this morning he sent a message to me saying, are you at Vivekananda? This is where I studied and uh, what not. I said, I'll definitely uh, talk to the students about it. From where he was and where he has grown today, uh, running US operations, not a joke for any uh, individual. Anyway, so coming back, <coughs> why I wrote the book, I don't know how, maybe some of you probably, your, your parents, I would say, let's say, would tell you 30 years back, when, where India was, uh, if you ask you want to eat fruits, they will say, let's go to Kashmir. If you buy a scooter at that time, because you want to come to college and buy a, on scooter, your scooter would be delivered to you after you are married and you have two children. It would take seven years for delivery of a uh, scooter. The smartphone that we are all using, every one of us, was only in the Star Wars movie. But never imagine or anyone that India would reach a stage where every one of us literally will have a uh, smartphone. And the worst, in 1991, India was bankrupt on foreign exchange. India had to mortgage gold to the Bank of England to borrow some dollars to repay some of the money for the oil import. Now suddenly from there, today we are talking about all of you are so positive, I would say energetic, ready to take on the world uh, tomorrow. And you feel India has a great opportunity how did this change come? <clears throat> so if you ask anybody, and my perception at that time, when I talked to a number of uh, 
Reserve Bank governors, policy makers who wrote the books on uh, history of India and whatnot. I was shocked that they didn't know the contribution of IT industry in changing India. They didn't know the contribution of NASCOM in changing IT industry. So there is a African proverb which says, if lions had historians, the stories of hunting would not have glorified the hunters. So I said, if no one has written the story, and I believe strongly that it is IT industry that has changed India, and it is NASCOM that has changed the IT industry, someone has to put it down. And that's what probably you can say one of the key motivator uh, for me to uh, write the book. But it went beyond also because I strongly believed in the NASCOM model. And for some number of reasons, I didn't write it down. I call it a secret sauce. Secret sauce to change any industry. Now, if you look at IT industry, <coughs> for the last 30 years, has grown at 30% compounded. If you take, ask uh, Rakesh Junjunwala, in the stock market, if you earn 18%, you say you are a king. If you earn 20% compounded, you are an emperor. And here is an industry that delivered 30%. And that changed the fortunes of all of us. And how, for example, in the last 20 years, I'll throw some numbers. Uh, our industry earned trillion dollars of foreign exchange. Trillion dollar. Now, the phone that we import today, or the oil that we import today, or the capital, capex that comes in, almost 50% of net foreign exchange is earned by our industry. Just imagine, if these earnings were not there, probably my view would be India would have broken up into many countries, like Russia or like Africa. Our industry created 5.3 million high-paying jobs. 5.3 million, out of which, as you talked about diversity, today our industry has 37% women. And from the new entrants coming in, 50% is women. And none of these women, let's say, had to know someone to get the job. They had to know what they know. They appear for the test and get the job. So that meritocracy also was injected uh, by our uh, industry uh, in the country. If you look at <coughs> corporate governance, I mean, India was very poor brand. And nobody would trust India. At that point, our industry came up with the corporate governance standards. So the quarterly financial reports that our company started producing were following the world standards in terms of corporate governance and the annual reports. And so that, over a time, built trust in India as a brand. Of course, supported by SEBI and uh, RBI and other uh, regulators, who also did a great job in uh, backing it up. But fundamentally, it started from this industry. And then the FDI money started flowing in. Again, that helped the whole Indian economy to uh, grow. So from <coughs> any angle you look at it, the contribution of this industry is multi-angle. And that's what I say, that story is not written. What happened, why it happened, how it happened. Something is not right, and that's what prompted me to write the book. I love the way the book is described, the maverick effect. I mean, what made you write that? I mean, is it, it was, is, is it a story of, you know, uh, extraordinary people dreaming together, building together, or was it something, was it like a secret sauce that made you think that this is a maverick effect? How did you come up with this, Harit Pai? <coughs> see, if you see this book, the cover design, that's why I said, that's why I requested, let the book be here. It sees the different bands are shown in an infinite uh, uh, growth pattern. Now, so each strand is a maverick. And it is a collective maverick effect of all the strands together that uh, contributed for the uh, change. We say 1 plus 1 equal to 11. But here it is 1 plus 1, 11, continuously over the last 30 years. And so that's the, I would call it a maverick effect. Now, why I call it a maverick effect? Principal talked about some of the values of NASCOM. 
no personal agenda, collaborate and compete. Now, I mean, I would extend that logic of collaborate and compete. It is collaborate and compete with no personal agenda, creative juices flowing, taking the decision at the highest common denominator level with single voice and recommending to the government what the policy changes are. Now, I'll give you one story. <clears throat> Early 90s, uh, multinationals wanted to set up 100% owned back office operations in India. Now, many of you may not be sensitive to what that means probably because there was a time where bureaucrats suffered from, I call it colonial mindset, and they always were feeling that you allow an MNC, like East India Company, they'll come and take over the uh, country. So they didn't want 100% own men ownership for any MNCs. But many of the MNCs who were our customers, they saw the great work our industry was doing. So they said, we would like to set up 100% own back, of, back office operation, which is our internal work which you're not going to contract out anywhere. So would you allow us to come in? Because we would like to leverage your talent. So when we all met, we said, why should you allow comp competitor to come in? As simple as that. Because first of all, MNCs, they'll take away our people paying double the salaries. Second was the same job that we are doing for them can be under the garb of back office. They'll shift it to their operations. So why should we allow them to come in? We have a natural protection given by the government. That's fantastic. But when we all debated, we said, but it also would help us uh, learn the quality processes from MNCs. Because we all had ho homegrown quality processes for software development. So we can learn from them. So that was one at what you call, what you call uh, attraction. The second was, the total pie at that time was $300 billion of outsourcing. And we were at maybe 150 million. So 150 million, 300 billion. Of course, we had hundreds of regulations choking the industry. But we said if we remove these obstacles, we still have another layer where these MNCs have to become acceptable to India as a software developer. Like in those days when we go to the prospect in uh, US, frankly, they would look at us as a thief. Because in India, we believe in right to copy, and not in copyright. So software piracy was rampant. So they thought, okay, we'll give our data programs to these guys, and they will go and sell it to my competitor tomorrow in the marketplace. So very, very, very poor brand of India. But we said, if we open up them, if we build trust of ease of doing business with India, all these other segments which are not open to us may open up and it will allow our industry to grow. So it was not, you can say, Mera Desh Mahane type of agent mindset. It was an enlightened self-interest. Okay, if you build India in brand in a different way, it will open up markets for us. So, and then at that point in our discussion, somebody said, whoever develops human capital of India is us, and who doesn't is not us. So will this MNCs develop human capital of India? Answer was obviously yes. So we all said, OK, this makes sense for us. And we should, then we talked to all the existing companies, TCAs, Infosys, Wipro, Genpact, everyone who was there in the business at that point in time saying, do you agree? Because you have to carry everyone with you. And they were all part of this discussion. So collaborate and compete but also saying what is good for India, keeping India first, with no personal agenda, agenda being mixed up. There was a personal agenda from the perspective that the market may open up tomorrow, but not, not directly changing the policies for some company or group of companies or benefit, which was a prevalent practice at that point in time. And then this creative juice is flowing where somebody says, whoever develops human capital of India is us. Allowing that thought to come up in a group discussion itself is a huge achievement. And then having the courage to back it up. So we said, yes, we should allow them. We met Finance Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh at that time saying we should allow 100% ownership. The finance, some of the secretary who was in the meeting, he said, Fir desh ko bechne aage. 
very, I mean, their whole mindset was very different. They believed that business people are crooks, frankly. And, but anyway, we were ready with our data, facts, and all stuff, and uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh did agree and allowed MNCs to come to India. Now, that simple decision, very simple decision of just saying allowing them, there was no investment from our side except the creative uh, juices flowing. That segment today has employs 1.2 million engineers in India. There we have 1,800 R&D centers. Many of these companies' heads are now part of their companies that they represent at the corporate level. They are co-creating future for these co Fortune 100 companies. Co-creating future for Fortune 100 companies. That's the kind of achievement. And of course, industry, IT industry also grew many, many fold in parallel. Those segments opened up, and that's the, all written in the book. But that's the history. But that's simple decision of, I call it maverick effect, made that huge uh, change. Very, very, very inspiring. I think having gone through this time by itself is, you know, gives you a lot of wisdom and a lot of insight into how you can see the future, think the future, and build the future. I, while the industry had a lot of backing from institutions, and institutions are built by people, right? I'm, I'm refraining to call it men because, you know, it's both <laughs> men and women who have built these institutions. So institutions are essentially built by people. I think people like you have immense contribution into building these institutions and then being the cheerleaders for these institutions to build the industry. I find your own story also very unconventional, you know, coming from the background where you know, family was into film distribution, and then you went to the US, and then you came back to India, and you know, tell us, tell us about that. How did you go through this ev evolution, and what was your motivation? I know, uh, I read in your bo book where your wife, uh, Selaja, right? Uh, Selaja, yeah. You and uh, her sort of discuss about coming back to India, and you know, uh, trying to find the roots back, and trying to build something out here, and then when you hear, um, as you fondly call your father Kaka, right? Yeah. He he was into into a into I think a difficult time I would say, going through all that, and then you know jumping and getting into starting what you did, I think is phenomenal. So what what is your story and how did that happen, Arishwan? First of all, it looks phenomenal in in hindsight. Yeah, that. <laughs> so at that time, it was just like a normal way. Every day passes, and uh, I always say that, like when we started NASCOM, we didn't have the vision that yesterday we declared the numbers at two forty-five billion dollars, and we had a nineteen billion dollars last year. And anyway, so all those numbers are there. We didn't have our vision was not even a billion dollar. I mean, when we went to Mr. Vittal, who was the DOE secretary at that time, said our vision is billion dollars. You know, he said, "Young man, do you know how many zeros are in a billion?" So we were ridiculed from that perspective of dreaming big, let's say you call it. Uh, but we stuck to our, uh, I will talk about it later if we have time. So going back to my personal story, I mean, uh, I was a database manager at, uh, okay, let me go back. You talked about I graduated from COAP Pune as an electrical engineer. I went to US to do my master's in electrical engineering. My roommate was one Sardar who had just graduated. He said, are you mad? Why are you doing electrical? Now the computer ka jamana aya. This is 1969, 70. In India, there was no so, such thing as computer. I mean, there were hardly maybe 10 computers in the whole country probably. There were hardly any. So, but, so nobody knew what computer is, frankly. So here is somebody telling me, and of course I looked around, nobody could guide me, but then enough info for the Brooklyn Poly where I say I must switch. So I big, big took computer science as my uh, pivoted to that. After I graduated, couldn't find a job. Struggled for two, three months, couldn't find a job. Finally, I ended up finding a job at an insurance company in the USA called Travelers Insurance Company, where I was became a COBOL programmer. Now in those days, I don't know how many of you know COBOL as a language for programming, but in those days it was called that 
you can teach a monkey with one week of training to do programming in COBOL. So here is a master's science, computer science graduate doing COBOL uh, programming work. But anyway, the company saw my talent in terms of I could do X, Y, and Z. They transferred me to become a database manager. You know, database manager was one of the very prestigious software position uh, in uh, those days. And of course, we tried our best to Americanize ourselves to, I had a green card also, by the way, and we, both of us, my, we tried our best to Americanize, we couldn't Americanize ourselves, and we felt that uh, we should go back to India. So we came back to India, and in a similar, like some conference, uh, I remember Sharu Rangnekar, he was a leading management consultant at that time, he came and he told me, welcome Mr. Mehta, here you are in a first class, you'll be a citizen in a second class country with a third class administration, and yours and my job is to fix it. So that's how my career started in India, and uh, my dad's business was not doing well. Uh, my father-in-law's business was in making, uh, they're still making uh, parts for two-wheelers. So he said, "You, why don't you make this zinc nipple, and uh, I'll buy you 100% production. So your demand issue is sorted, you focus on. So he said, he took me to here, Kanjur Mark, and showed me a gala where I had to set up this zinc uh, nip, nipple manufacturing. When I saw the, that gala, I said, shocking. The labor conditions, the gala conditions. I said, I have not come back from USA to be <laughs> working in such a place. So it was very, very depressing at that point in time. And then, uh, of course, my cous uh, cousin said, Arish, take the next flight back to Bombay, uh, to New York. This is not a place for you. This is a very, you are a straightforward person. And in India, you do not know what your competitor's cost is going to be. Somebody will do excise story, somebody will do customs story, somebody will do income tax story. He said, when you do not know the input cost of your competitor's product, how are you going to compete? So that was an atmosphere or environment. And that's where I decided I'll enter the technology business. Because you cannot bribe a jump instructions to go ahead and do your processing. Uh, so that's how the tech, I entered the, so and there was a software scheme that has come out of the government saying if you export X percentage uh, of the import value, you can uh, be allowed to import this computer and do local work and then also do the export work uh, around it, which was the software basically uh, driven. And I was a database manager, I re remember that sitting in USA, what I could do, I could do the same work sitting in India. All I needed was a pipe access to computers at that Hartford, Connecticut, and have access to those state-of-the-art computers, applications, databases, and do the same work. But I was getting paid 1 15th of that, what I was getting paid in USA. So the labor arbitrage benefit very apparent. But once I entered the game, so that's how I entered the business, and but once I entered the game, I realized hundreds of, you can say, regulations choking the industry. We then, we were, I was just, I was, I'm more a software product person than a services person. So we put a team in Mysore to develop a database, relational database technology. I'm going back to mid 80s at Mysore, away from our, assuming that culturally it requires a different setup and whatnot. It, we burned a lot of money and we failed miserably. And I identified some eight reasons why, why India is not ready for the software product business. And I pivoted to services. And then all these regulations were choking us and that's where I say, if because there's a $300 billion pile, we were at maybe 30, 40 million in India. In order to cross that, you need to have these government regulations to be worked on. And the only way you can do in a, and I, there are some other stories where I realized the power of an association in India and said we must form uh, some software association. So I went around the country, met there were some 30, 40 companies who were in software services business. We all came together and formed NASCO. Amazing. That's right. <laughs> really, really amazing. I think that, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know, at least I feel very inspired when I hear these stories. I want to now switch back to the 
the people here, right? All the students here. Uh, how many of you really feel that you would like to become an entrepreneur someday? I mean, if not now, if just raise your hands. How many of you would like to start your own? Anybody? Okay, good. A few hands coming up. Very good. Very good. How many of you would like to read this book? <laughs> wow, that's that's a lot of people. So I think this is very interesting. I mean, like ma'am said, right? When she picked up the book, it took like hardly any time for us to just read the whole thing. It is so uh, so engripping and it's so evolving. I think it, you've very nicely written the book uh, in in like a storyline and uh, very engrossing. I think it, I had the same effect, ma'am. When I got this book from, and then it was personally signed by uh, Mr. Mehta. So I hope when you get the book today, it also gets signed by Mr. Mehta. I hope that's fine. Sure, sure. No issue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, now talking about this generation, we we call this generation as a bite-sized generation, right? You know why? Because everything is bites now, right? I mean, all you are consuming, or even us. We are consuming very small bites of information. Look at reels. What is the size of a reel? How many of you guys watch reels? Come on, yeah. Don't be shy. Huh? Come on, raise your hands. How many of you guys watch a three and a half hour movie? Good, very good. Glad to see this. Now, I think the point is that I'm trying to bring. This is a bite-sized generation. This book will take some time to read and absorb. If they have to read this, what should they take away from this and what should they look for inside this book when they read this book? And we go to hand over 10 books today to those who ask a question. So there are at least 10 books that um, our partner, Thai Mumbai, has given us. So these can be your personal copies, but we hope you will circle it among yourselves so that everybody gets a chance to see that. And we will ha we also have some extra copies that we'll keep in the library. But at the same time, uh, there are 10 books going out today, signed by Harish Bhai, personalized by him. And I think that's a very exclusive thing, believe me. I mean, I stood in a queue when he was handing over the book. And, and, and people, I mean, the much more senior and more recognized people were standing in the queue to get that book from him. So that's the kind of effect the maverick effect has on you, OK? So so what do you think, sir? I mean, what should they really take away from this book? There is a famous quote by Isaac Newton, which says, uh, we can see far away, not just because we are tall, but we stand on the shoulders of mavericks because what we have learned all those lessons that we have learned and the i would say the trajectory we have built for the industry and the india to grow into extrapolate that in the future you can aim much better you can because we have defined certain boundaries certain challenges of india certain all other uh, what we have gone through so when you do, whether you, are, you join a company and eventually become an entrepreneur like uh, N. Chandra of Tata Sons or Deepak Parekh or uh, HDFC, or you become an entrepreneur like from Manara and Murthy's to other successful uh, builders uh, of uh, companies uh, in India. Either way, it's great opportunity for going forward. But then how do you aim faster, better, smarter I hope that this book or the story of NASCOM, the story of uh, all the Mavericks, little bit stories, there are not many, and how we change and overcome so many obstacles, my sense is that it will be a great uh, lesson for you to uh, go forward. So that would be one reason I would say to read the book. So in my view, Mavericks are people who defy rules, who create their own rules, who go and then, you know, uh, chart out uncharted paths. And frankly, I think when, when I read this book, it, it sort of, I can relate to a lot of things that I've never ever imagined I would have done in a job, but when I actually started my company, I did so many different things. 
I wouldn't call myself a maverick, but there is a maverick effect in all of us, right? And this generation, if they have to really think like a maverick, if they have to act like a maverick, what is it that you would like to tell them? And what is it that they should take away from the, the book as a story that they should really feel that, okay, here is something that I should go out and try out. Here is something that I should be bold enough to uh, build out and, and not just maybe do a nine to seven job. I'm not against that. <laughs> I've, I've done that. I mean, for for uh, almost till 2013, I was uh, I was employed. And 14 is when I actually started my company. So I was actually at the age of 40, by the way. Uh, so yeah, I mean, what is it that they should really act? I mean, not really act, but really think like a maverick. Again, there are a couple of ways of looking at it. One is, and I believe very strongly that whatever you do over the next 30, 40 years should align to contributing to India. In changing India to become, I call it, Sonic Ichidia version 2.0. Or smart nation. There are multiple ways of defining what that uh, India would be uh, tomorrow. And you contributing it. India needs to create 90 million jobs over the next 10 years. Now, you need to think whether you want to be an entrepreneur who will create jobs, or you want to be one of that who gets a job and you join a company, and through that company you uh, contribute in creating uh, jobs. Uh, our per capita income is hardly $2,000. It has to go to at least $10,000. So again, if you can contribute in those areas by which the per capita income goes up, now, if you look at the technology world specifically, and how many of you know chat GPT? Oh, wow. <laughs> so now, you have a tool with you very soon. In the next few years, you will see four, five, six chat GPT, all that can come. It will make each one of you, in some sense, a superhuman. It has that potential. You need to think through and how to uh, leverage that uh, technology. And then you look at, in my book, in the, I have a chapter 14 where I identify the structural problems of India. You can pick any one, two, or whatever, and say, I will focus my energy in solving some of those issues. And you use this chat GPT, and there are, again, multiple technologies, which you all know from uh, uh, quantum computing coming in, IoT, robotics, uh, biotech marrying IIT, and whole new revolution that has already started uh, in that area. And like that, there are many such areas and will keep on multiplying, according to me, as the technology uh, advances. More and more new such technologies will come. And India has 1,000 problems to solve. So a great opportunity. You have a way to solve this India's problem, be it poverty, be it healthcare, be it education, you name it. You have an opportunity to solve India's problems. And if you succeed in solving India's problem, you can go global. There's no reason why you can't build a global company uh, sitting from India. So that would be my suggestion that look at that broad picture, leverage technology, plus the whatever other domain areas that you build your expertise on, blend it together and solve these issues. Uh, in fact, in the, in the recently held NASCOM Technology Leadership Forum, there is somebody who said, uh, very well said that, you know, uh, India is a POC to the world. Sorry? India is a POC to the world. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Well, that has sort of stuck in my head and, you know, every event I go, I talk about it because it makes so much sense. I mean, there is something that you build in India, which is tested in India, which is rolled out Absolutely. in public, which is, you know, can work anywhere. It's a disruption in by itself, right? I, I think it's... It's a, it's a very powerful statement, and there is so much that this generation can actually contribute to that. So we, I just had Vijay here. At NTLA, I also had one sentence, which was so powerful, that people are scared of some of the disruptive technologies that will eliminate jobs and whatnot. Where Srikant, one of the founder of Fractal, he said, humans who will use AI will replace humans who don't use AI. Very powerful statement. 
So that's what you need to keep in mind, that you need to, what do you call, be proficient in this technology tools like, not chat GPT, but there'll be many such uh, tech solutions available to you. You have to embrace them. And because otherwise, if not, your job will be eliminated five years from now by somebody, not even sitting in India, maybe sitting in uh, Africa in some country. Because the technology is providing a level playing field globally, not only for India. We have certain natural advantages. We must go all out, all out for it. But keep that in mind that it's a great opportunity and try to embrace it as deeply as you can. In fact, you know, I can relate this because back in my times when I was a developer and, you know, in fact, I was also an OCA, uh, Oracle Certified uh -huh. Administrator. And when we used to code, I think the technology would change every five years. And there was quite a bit of sort of uh, runway that I would get to learn, implement, advancement and then be an expert but now i think it's every year the technology changes it's just phenomenal time that i see that you know with this kind of evolution i think it's throwing up new challenges but i think this generation which is far more advanced intelligent smart i think can really pick up some of these things and disrupt them and that creates a lot of opportunity for this young generation to create startups, enterprises, and build the future of India. So for, for a lot of people that do studied with me, in those days it was very natural for them to go on site. Right? Everybody said, oh, I want to work in a company and then I, go on to, I want to go on site. For some reason, I think even those days, and I'm talking about, uh, I think, 97, 98, 2000, early 2000, I was convinced that I think if I have to build a story, then I can still do it in India. If I have to build a career, I mean, there was no story then, but if I have to build a career, why not in India? As I, I had like through those two decades and three decades, I had a lot of opportunities to go abroad and settle there. While I traveled, and I traveled a lot, both in the US and Europe, but I somehow never felt the need of building something there, and I always wanted to build something in India. Now, I think this is an aspiration even this generation has. Right? What would you advise this generation? Whether should they some look at opportunities in India or sh is this something that she sh should consider going abroad and then maybe coming back or starting something on there? What do you think that this generation should do at this point of time when you know the ecosystem has opened up, the startup ecosystem has opened up, there is flush of venture capital coming in, there are startups starting every day, and there are, I'm almost preempting the answer, but you know, there is immense opportunities today than what we had. So what is your advice to this generation from that perspective, Arish Bhai? I mean, I, frankly, I don't really have an advice in some ways. I don't like to give advice, basically. I let the individual decide what he or she would like to uh, do. Going abroad, nothing wrong with that, I believe, very strongly. It's up to, again, individual. All I can say is there's opportunity in India are fantastic. And that's what somebody can look, think through. For just to give an example, every minute 30 people move from a village to a town. In 10 years, we will have literally a population of United States living in the cities who would need infrastructure, who would need hospitals, who would need educational uh, institutes, who would need a number of things. So that's an opportunity in front of us. I'm not even looking at the global opportunity where there is a aging population and all other challenges coming up, or there is a climate challenge. So there are enough opportunities in India for you to succeed and build a global. But I also don't see anything wrong going abroad if somebody wants to do, most welcome. Like when, when 30 years back, when government asked us, that all the IITNs are going abroad, we must put a tax on them for going abroad. So they ask our opinion. We said, you want brain in drain or you want brain drain? We did, uh, we said, no, let them do. I mean, the talent should go wherever talent wants to go. Talent can be uh, absorbed and accepted. Now, some of them left and we were Sundar Pichai's and the Satya Nadella's who went to US and they became the CEOs of those companies. So like that, you will find successes coming into and India is a, I mean, globally, there are so many opportunities. 
I'm, all I would say is you must keep on, as you said just before, be a continuous learner. Keep some of the fundamental new values or new ways of to remaining successful tomorrow and excel in whatever you do, wherever you go. That's very nice. Thank you so much. And just taking a couple of uh, more cues from your journey, I think uh, I also read that your first venture was when you were in College of Engineering in Pune, right? Yeah. And I believe you're still attached to the alma mater in some way or the other. Right? Tell us about that. How did that happen? And, and where did that took off? And where, how did that sort of help you establish yourself as an entrepreneur? I can just very happen naturally. Uh, we, I was with the Pune Engineering College, and we had a three years engineering program, changed over to a four years engineering program. And the four years engineering program had completely different touch. So all the books had changed. And at COAP, we had more than 50% of students who were below certain income level. So they couldn't afford all those new books. So one doctor, Shantilal Desai, who was the head of CWPRS, he was quite concerned about it. And I just happened to meet him, and then he said, I would like to set up a library at COAP where we raise X funds, and through those funds, we will uh, give free books to all these students. So that was a starting point. And then, whether you call it entrepreneurial skills or whatever, I remember my dad was in film business, so I said, why not we show a movie, collect some sponsorship money, and give that as a uh, donation uh, to the college. And that's where uh, we started. So I approached one film producer named, I forgot his name, but movie name, Gujarati movie named Kalapi. And the producer, Without him, but just blink, without him blinking, he said, you can have it at no charge. It's a good cause, and I'll be very ready to support you. And then, of course, we worked hard in the Pune's local community. We raised some one lakh rupee, uh, maybe one and a half lakh rupees uh, in those days as a collection. 50,000 was the cost. And from one lakh rupee, uh, we gave away the books. So. And then, of course, we continued that uh, program of ra keep raising funds and giving books away. So that was my first social venture that way. And it was a pleasure to see the, the eyes of the students lighting up when you give the books, their parents' happiness, and whatnot. We could build careers of hundreds of uh, engineers that way. Very nice. Very nice. I think every, every statement that's coming out here, it's again rubbing it on me, inspiring me to do more. I hope that you are also having that effect, right? Yeah, I hope everybody will go out from this room with the maverick effect today. <laughs> I'll tell you a story here, another. This reminds me yeah. that this maverick effect became so strong, so powerful, that about 15 years back, China decided to compete with India. And there, so India comes suddenly from a you know, snake charmer's country, started making waves on the technology front and especially the software, which are the, all the advanced technologies of, in the software area, and creating so many jobs, so many different cities coming up. So they were very, you can say, impressed by the growth of Indian tech services industry. So they said, it's a great, we must replicate this and go beyond India. Now you just know China, when Chinese government, the authoritarian, once they make up their mind, tough to compete with anybody. They've done it shown in sector after sector. So now they appointed foresters, uh, which is one of the leading uh, agency who do the research in these areas. And so you come up with a master plan for us to not only compete with India, but be number one in tech services globally. So John McCarthy, who is the CEO of uh, foresters, uh, he told the Chinese government and the industry that you cannot compete with India till you create NASCOM equivalent association. He said, I have not seen anywhere in the world, IBM, Capgemini, Accenture, TCS, Infosys, Wipro, all these different companies sitting around a table, keeping India first with no personal agenda, creative juices flowing and solving the industry problem. You need to replicate that model to compete with the 
tech services business. So we didn't realize the impact of what we are doing. Even Carly Fiorina, at that time she was the head of HP. She said, okay, you guys set out to earn some money in foreign exchange and started building the outsourcing as a business model. But that outsourcing business model has now changed the world a little bit. So that's what you do today. You have no idea what that different use cases will come up as you uh, grow and build on it. Great. One more story that I would like to hear from you, uh, Harifai. I mean, I, I love the way you dress, but I also heard that you were once dressed as Swami Vivekananda <laughs> in a fashion show in NASCOM. <laughs> so, so tell us about that. How did that happen? What's the story there, Harifai? <laughs> Before that, I must give a little more background. Sure. Uh, this was a fashion show. Now, what does Vivekananda has to do with the fashion show as such? But, see, those, that was the time when our brand was, India Inc. brand was so poor. We wanted one product or a one service from India, which was world class. And you'll be surprised we didn't find any. Not a single manufactured product or a single service that we can claim has etched attain the world-class status. So when we have our annual seminars at NTLA, which you are there, half of them are coming from abroad. How do you build India Inc. brand in front of them? What do you talk to them? I can't keep talking Arya Bhattas and uh, 3,000 years back, what happened and what not. I mean, that's up to a point, one or two minutes, but then what next? What are you doing today? Where, is the, where are the other sides of your country which are thinking like you people are thinking, I, I should I trust your country fundamentally for that you will deliver this kind of complex projects on time and whatnot. So the big challenge and we were struggling. So suddenly we saw Aishwarya Rai and uh, Sushmita Sen winning the Miss Universe or Miss, uh, Miss World uh, title. Oh, that's, that's world-class quality. And you'll be surprised that we, it will sound very frivolous to have a fashion show at a high deep te technology conference. But we said that's the only option we have. So we said we'll have it, have the fashion show with us. But how do you add value to it and not look like it's a cheap uh, way of entertaining people? So we said, and luckily I knew this gentleman, uh, Bardwaj, who was who acted as a Ram in Mahabharat serial. So I co connected with him. I said, what can we do? So he came up with a theme. He said, what you should do is, have Vasudeva Kutumbakam as a theme. And entire backdrops to whatnot, all our brochures, everything would be around Vasudeva Kutumbakam as a uh, theme. And in the fashion show, he said, we will have these different players coming in, showing India's strength. So the first global Indian that we found was Vivekananda. And that's how we chose, uh, I acted, I wore that. Vivekananda's clothes and uh, walked on the ramp. So that's the story behind it. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, definitely multifaceted person. <laughs> no, but it's not me. I'm just uh, because I'm an, I'm a narrator. I'm a storyteller here. There are many others at NASCOM who all contributed to uh, where we are. Great. And finally, I think uh, I wanted to just bring this out because there's one uh, term that's stuck in my head when I read your book. How many of you are Gujaratis here? Very few? Okay. All right. So there's a term called Retima Vahan Charlo. Basically, sailing a ship in the sand. What's the background to that? Why, why did that come up? And I know this is a lot of struggle that it talks about. But how did that come to you? I mean, if you look at where India was 30 years back that, and where it is today. How did the change happen? So even uh, I was telling you that one of our Thai Mumbai directors, Vinod Kenny, and uh, he told, us the, told me this story just two weeks back. That his daughter, she is 21 years old and was going abroad for uh, studies. So he gave her this book to read. He felt that she should know. And she's a voracious reader. So she read the book and came back to him and said, Dad, this sounds like a fiction. How can it happen in a country like India, uh, this kind of change? Like, for example, when we started NASCOM, we all decided that we will not bribe 
we, in spite of hundreds of regulations choking us, we will not bribe any officer any time to make a policy change. Oh, that's brilliant. Now That's commendable. Right? Yeah, so it's taking that hard decision, but it came again out of collective strength. Everybody had to agree with that sort of... Uh, so that allowing that, what do you call, uh, is like a fiction. And then we built a trustworthy environment between the policymakers and us. Like as I said before, policymakers are looking at us as saying, East India Company, I went to, they won't trust the businessman. A major trust deficit between the policymakers and us. Even today also it is there. It's not only then. But we decided, okay, we will build trust between us and the uh, policymakers. And we took a number of decisions uh, in the process. One quickly, I can tell you a story when Mr. Bitt, we wanted software export income tax benefit. It was given to all other industries, but not to software services, because software services was, was not even considered as an industry. So we were not part of that plan to give us the benefit. But to us, it was a huge uh, benefit to uh, our industry. So he said, why not us? So Mr. Whittle came back to us and he said, uh, I talked to the finance secretary, Mr. Bimal Jalan at that time. And he said, okay, if the industry can do $400 million, we'll give you the export benefit. Or at least or we'll keep the benefit for one year, but we will renew it only if you do 400 million. And we were at 150 million, and then we all sat together and we said, we can't do it. Maximum we can do is 200. And the benefit comes today by the time you leverage it, invest. It takes three years before the results come out. So we studied and we went back to Mr. Vital and we said, sir, we can't do it. He said, you don't want the benefit. No, no, we want the benefit but not by misleading or cheating you. And he was so happy listening to our answer that his, all the regulation which was sort of choking us, he started taking one by one and working on it and fixing it. So that built the trust and that allowed us to continue to uh, bring in the change. It reached a point where Mr. Whittle told that, you know what NASCOM stands for? N for nuts, A for asshole, uh, second, third, uh, S is for stupid, another S is for screwball, M for mad, O for hard <laughs> And so it's M for mad, and I am the leader of this group, he would say. <laughs> I mean, just imagine in those days, bureaucrat who would consider himself God compared to industry, saying I am with them. So that partnership between politicians, bureaucrats, and the industry allowed us to co-create the future, which you will eventually see in the Satyam story, how we all work together uh, to save India in Prime. Yeah, I think that's, even that story is a phenomenal story. I think the way the government came forward and all the industry veterans came forward and companies came forward to, yeah. you know, save not just the company, but the brand India. Yeah. I think because everybody knew with, with the whole thing that happened in Satyam. By the way, the Satyam chapter 12, is now, uh, if you, when you go for your management MBA at ISB, and if you take a course on corporate ethics, it's a compulsory read, the Satyam chapter in that area. Yeah. Great, I think this is, uh, for me, it was a great session. Thank you, Arish Bhai, for being here. And clearly, you can see the effect that you have on me. And I would now open this to, to the young audience here, you know, anybody who has any questions to ask, and you know what's in it for you, right? Yes, yes, come on. Right. Okay. So if you can just take the names and then we can go to the boardroom and you know, give the books. By the way, just I wanted to add, I'm seeing Shabnam say, it reminds me that uh, I brought Thai, the Indus entrepreneurs, uh, to India. So the, well, you may have heard the name of Mr. Kanwal Reiki. You can see United States is one of the topmost uh, angel investor. He was on my board, Onward Novel, and he would keep on teasing me, saying that you're getting paid for your sweat as NASCOM. 
services business. You're not getting paid for your brain, which is the product game or entrepreneurship game. Because there the impact multiplier could be massive and very quickly. Versus services, which is a slow growing uh, game. So he kept saying you should focus on entrepreneurship and product driven work. And I would tell uh, Kanwal that I have failed miserably in the product game in India. These are the eight challenges. So we are not ready for that. And he kept saying, then of course he changed his mind after kept coming to India and seeing what all these challenges are. In 1998, when the dot-com boom happened, uh, Sridhar Iyengar, who was one of the, again, KPMG India's managing director, he told me, he said, Harish, my landlord in California is asking me not the rent, but the stock options of the company that I'm investing in. I said, why is it that? So that's where I realized the, that the dot-com boom is coming. The internet is having this massive impact. Whole world is changing. So India should not miss out that bus. And that's where we brought uh, tie into India and said so we must encourage uh, entrepreneurship in India. And today we have more than 32 chapters in India, a massive in terms of uh, what we are doing. Maybe I'll request Sabnam to spend a few minutes telling about what Thai is doing. Come, Sabnam. And just so that you know, uh, I am a charter member of Thai Mumbai, and Harish Bhai is on the board of Thai Mumbai. And I think I have a very long association with them. Clearly, Thai Mumbai um, will also in the future, or rather even now, I think they've been supporting us in a lot of ways, but with our new incubation center coming up next door, Thai Mumbai is going to be our mentorship partner. I think that's, I say, okay. Right? Yeah. Thank you, Arish Bhai. Yes, we'll be really inspired and, and we all are enlightened. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Started in Silicon Valley in 1992, and Harish Bhai is the person who got Thai in Bombay. Thai currently has like 32 chapters in India and 65 chapters across the globe. So Thai is one of the largest entrepreneurial organization which focus on fostering entrepreneurship, and we focus on five pillar that is mentoring, networking, education, investing, and incubation. So Thai helps any individual who are in budding entrepreneur or startup, who want to start the business or scale the business. Thai is the platform for them. We do have mentors who are established entrepreneur, industry leaders, senior management professional, and investors who join Thai to give back to the society. So they are the mentor of Thai Mumbai. So we do have uh, you know, great stories which has come through Thai Mumbai. So everyone would have heard about Karwale. So Karwale got the mentoring and connect to investors through Thai Mumbai. And uh, the great st exit stories has come through Karwale. We do have stories like India Games, which sold to Disney. So that is the story which has come again through Thai Mumbai. And I'll tell you, one of the student of IIT Bombay, Sumit Chajat, founded Auto Capital. Through, again, you know, he leveraged the Thai Mumbai platform to get mentors and to get connected to the investors. Currently, he raised $6 million from Metrix Partner. <laughs> and we do support lots of uh, global entrepreneurship program. Uh, one of the program is run by um, UK government. In that, if anyone wants to start the business or expand the business in UK, we help them. So one of the uh, our time member, uh, we got like 378 application, and through our mentoring program, we groomed her to get uh, interview through UK official. Currently, she got green signal from UK to start uh, her business in UK, and she is none other than the visit alumni. Yeah. Her name is Deepika Singh. Yeah. yeah. So this all stories has come through Thai Mumbai. And we look forward to engage with uh, Vezit in helping and creating entrepreneurs. Thank you, Arish Bhai. Thank you, all of you. Great. So I did see some hands going up. 
Are you ready for the questions? Who's going first? Yeah. Hello. Hello, sir. My name is Ashish Gupta. First of all, thank you to address us on the technology day of Vesit. So my question is, sir, uh, you have built the nation in the time of crisis. In 1991, uh, when the time was uh, India is going to be bankrupt, so you have built up a nation uh, with Uh, software outsourcing. Uh, following that frameworks, currently India is following a startup boom. Okay, but all currently also we are at a time of crisis where the, we are uh, in a step to hit the recession. So, what are the trends that we need to identify as a young professional so that we can uh, take more advantage of this opportunity? I mean, number of things you can do. One is, uh, uh, I say that once you join, whatever you do, whether you stop, become an entrepreneur or join a company or whatever, very, after three or four or five years of experience, once you start seeing area around you, not just focus on what you do, focus on the entire ecosystem that you are in. And you contribute, I say, 10% of your time in giving the exponential growth to that ecosystem. Because the work that you do, you will try for exponential growth in your work anyway. But same creative energy should be used for building the ecosystem. Like I gave an example of how we allowed MNCs to come in. It's an ecosystem move. No individual company benefited. There was nothing to do with that. But it is, again, creative juices of people around the table that allowed it to flow. So that creative juices to flow in a collaborative manner is what you should be spending 10% of your time in building the ecosystem. Now, it's a very high level stuff. But that's what one of my uh, recommendations would be for young entrepreneurs to do, uh, or as a youngsters to do. The second, I would say is today in the startup world, there is no association equivalent to NASCO. So that has to happen. Okay, build an association to represent startups in front of the policy makers, ecosystem builders, everyone. So then, if there are certain startups misbehave, how do you control that? How do you educate all other startups, be it corporate governance, be it uh, internal sales reporting? There are a number of areas where corporate governance, governance is a major weakness. Similarly, artificial intelligence. The capacity and the capability of the policy makers is not enough to take decisions using these advanced technologies. So we need to again invest time and money effort to retrain, reskill these officers so that they can take an appropriate decision. I hope these are again all high level suggestions from that perspective, but that's to keep you uh, in mind that, keep in your mind, that's very important for overall segment to grow. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Recently, we have been hearing of all the layoffs going on in software sector. So what do you think is the re reason behind it? Uh, layoffs happening in the software sector. What Sorry? Is, what is the reason behind the layoffs happening in the IT industry? In the software? Yeah, in IT industry. That is a natural process of lay layoffs, attrition, technology changes. What do you do if you cannot reskill yourself? Uh, if the big tech companies also when you see chat GPT coming in, will have a huge impact the way we work. So you start taking those decisions very early in the game. So laying off, layoff to me is just a part of the process. It is not such a negative stigma. You will find, my sense is that same person will find a better job somewhere else. So it's just a way of, what do you call, reorganizing, rearranging. If you look at companies like Instagram, before Facebook bought, it has gone through 19 pivots. Means many startups on a bar, they're saying, drinking together, two entrepreneurs, and then say, hey, why can't I take my piece, give it to you, you take your pieces, and then it's a bit stronger one. So yes, few people will be laid off on both the sides, but the one what survives would be the stronger. It's a law of nature. If you see how the nature theory of evolution over the last few billion years is what industry is following. Uh, so good afternoon everyone I, uh, and 
thank you hari sir and vijay sir for this session i would like to ask that uh, we as most of the third years are there in this auditorium if i'm not wrong so they are preparing for jobs so after getting into jobs how can now like as per the present time how can somebody like uh, start up their own startup as you mentioned in previously that's my question so your question is being in third year how should you start yes, something yes. and then like most of them are aiming towards starting their startup after mostly after going to their jobs or mostly after graduation so that was my question how do we okay see i think uh, very clearly if you are in a technology industry you need to think product you need you need to have that mindset of developing something creating something that is relevant for the industry there's a need for the industry and for businesses addressing either a problem or a business need right now yes. if you really think about it there are i think there are innumerable ideas and product i product solutions that you can develop at the stage that you are in in the third year my personal advice is that this is not the time for you to hit the market to do business but i think this is a very valuable time for you to invent to innovate mm -hmm. and build something that will be for the future so once you are out after your you know eighth semester i think that's the time when you can actually start doing what we generally say is you know uh, mvps and taking to the market doing go to market uh planning and all that you know i think that's the time when you should hit having said that there are a lot of startups which started much before also there were i think there are many i can name today but i myself invested in a young guy who's today doing i think is fourth year engineering in somaya he started two years ago so i gave him a very small seed money to start and it is a product it's still surviving by the way <laughs> so i mean there are a lot of startups that shut down right so it's a it's a known fact there are like uh, success is one person right there will be an, an average about 10 percent or 20 percent that will survive the the journey but i think what is important is that when you build something build with a lot of research that you've done of what is the need and what is the innovation that you can bring and if you're able to start that now and build it over the next two years i think this gives you a good run away yes sir thank you so much also sir i'd like to ask how can ai how can ai help us in starting up a startup learn ai <laughs> <laughs> yes sir thank you so much great session so sir you have been the director of indian angel network for 6 to 7 years if i'm not wrong so what's the biggest point of distinction you saw between the us and indian startups as well as the ecosystem particularly pertaining to the revenue and the business model right that's one number one secondly uh, keep in in mind the purchasing power you know of india as you mentioned it's around 2500 Uh, should startup not target western markets first especially indian startups i mean when you compare us startups and the indian startups yeah especially in terms of business even models. in the us startups sometimes most of the time i would say we meet are indian entrepreneurs driving it so it is basically indians on both sides that they drive the model the difference one would be definitely that person who is exposed to us us culture us purchasing power us competition things in a very different way same way when an indian entrepreneur would think differently because indian entrepreneur would look around to like you talked about bhavik uh, uh, ola cab uh, yeah. entrepreneur like the story is that he had wanted a taxi to go from iit bombay to uh, railway station mm. and he couldn't find it. it and he missed the train So he said, "Why can't we offer?" Yeah, that was the start service. of Ola. Yes. So idea came from experiencing a problem around it. And um, that's I would say seventy to eighty percent we see it happening that way, that either an individual or a group of people, students, 
uh, in a college, sit together, brainstorm, and come up with an idea. And similar model we see in USA. But what difference is the application of the uh, solution? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, my, uh, as you said that you had to fight against the bureaucracy and the government to, to remove all the regulations that were choking the industry at that at that time. So I would like to ask that uh, it it must have needed a lot of courage. So how and where did you find such courage at that time? How did you find uh, to, the courage to fight, to fight the to go uh, uh, convince the find bureaucracy. the courage? Yeah. I don't think I am. Uh, I mean, it's your right to do it. Where is the question of courage? Well, who are they? Thank you. I mean, who are they? We have to, they also like us. So just go and meet them. I don't, I mean, in that sense, avoid hierarchy and all that. We, we start building. Think that they're also human beings like us. They also want to see good of India. We also want to see good of India. And talk at that level. We ask the many bureaucrats, what do you want your children to be? You want your children to go abroad, or you want children to take your influence and get a job, or you want children to be proud of himself, themselves and then grow. They themselves, yeah, we would like our children to be proud of what they do. Now, how will they become? Then you go to the set of arguments. They get convinced very easily that what you say is what they should be doing. Okay, sir. Thank you. Good morning, sir. My name is Janavi Aute, and uh, my question is, so uh, how do you see the future of engineering and IT services, and what role do you think that uh, onward technologies can play to shaping in future? Last week only we met, as I was telling you about NASCOM, uh, we had met, and we declared roughly $245 billion for the, as the industry top line. Uh, we are seeing 350 billion, and the, s the next goal is 500 billion by 2030. So it's a, as of now, it's an extremely bright future, is what I would say. When it will change, in like chat GPT type of areas will come and change certain, it may accelerate certain areas, it may decelerate, all that will happen as a part of the process. But India as a country has a natural strength globally on the technology side. No other country has like 5.3 million uh, engineers trained into so many advanced technologies and another million ready to join. So we have a great advantage uh, going forward. It's a very bright future. Well, hello, sir. Uh, first of all, a very congratulations for the first year anniversary of your book publishing. And I would like to ask a question, like for on the foundation stone of NASCOM towards a two, 200 billion plus company valuation, you have seen many highs and lows for, with NASCOM and with other companies like Onward Technologies too. But taking into consideration that market as it grows, as it falls much more, and it would bounce back much more greater than the fall. But can we say that recession and layoffs and this all, like chat GPT has failed 54, like it, conquered 54 questions above 100 in the UPSC exam and the chat GPT failed and new models are also launching and they are also failing right now. So can we say that it is the downfall of the IT industry? No, no, why would you say, I mean, they, we have seen waves after waves of technology coming in. Each time there will be all kinds of fears. Automation is an, in, what do you call, inbuilt part of our industry. Today, if you look at the most of the IT companies, when they project next year's numbers, they project 10% of business will go away because of automation. And on top of that, you will add 15%. So you have to target 25% growth, so you end up declaring 15. So industry is not worried about automation. That is the nature of the business that we are in. But these signs like recessions and layoffs, like technology is failing nowadays. So are this the sign of downfall? No, as I said before, that Srikanth said, humans with AI will replace humans without AI. That's the fundamental base you have to assume. Okay, sir. Thank you. I think it's level higher. A lot of people are worried about the, the changes that we are seeing in the IT. I, I think it's just a part of evolution. 
it is it is not something that uh, as engineers or as an industry that we need to be overly concerned about yes you should be concerned yeah. about but what should be concerned about you should be concerned about your skills are you are you relevant for the industry i think that's very Absolutely. very important you know so if you're if you're really concerned about today as you know budding engineers be concerned about your own skill set that you're developing whether is that relevant for the next 5 10 years is there a need for what you know today in the industry frankly if there is no need then you know the answer but you also know the answer of what you need to do right so this evolution will happen like i was telling arish bhai earlier in my days i mean i worked on oracle plsql in you know those days was oracle developer 2000 reports and i mean it took 5 years for the technology to and i i started coding in uh, java almost like in my 7th year of my career and then java was also through a evolution where i did a lot of servlet programming have you heard about this like enterprise java bean servlet programming and all that you know that's like extinct now right but there was a lot of evolution that happened and every 5 years we used to see a change but now every year the technology is changing every year there is some disruption happening so i this is what i tell my engineers i mean i there are a lot of vestitians who are part of my company i mean i and and i tell my team members also the same thing that if you are relevant today if your skill is relevant i don't think you need to fear about anything and and you know if there is a shake up or a shake down or whatever it is i think you'll find your way and and it has happened it has happened for, for a lot of people and people eventually find a way so so you need to be at all concerned about it just be concerned about what you know today and what you need to learn and how you need to sort of develop yourself as an engineer as a professional for the for the industry that's really what you should be worried about let me give you an example here chat gpt generates code so if you consider coding as your career path maybe you are wrong because you know chat gpt will create it will keep on improving and what not so your job as a coder should be how to see check the co code how do you edit it how do you test it how do you debug it and then you release it so your job will change yeah it may eliminate some jobs here and there but because of the speed you will deliver your application faster if you deliver your application faster you solve your customers problem faster your customers business grows he has one more product line creates 100000 jobs in that line so that's how the it works that suddenly you will find like smartphone i mean uh, how many jobs it must have eliminated from camera every every app that you see has eliminated x number of jobs of that particular profession but has really impact been seen no yes those are there at that point i would be definitely impacted no question about it like i talked about vasudev vasudev kutumbakam in my story and one of the objective was that we were replacing jobs of uh, americans or europeans because when we do the outsourcing their jobs like were getting replaced so we said that we our objective is not to replace your job our objective is to solve your customers problem who in will grow will create more jobs in the society in short don't lose your natural intelligence hmm. because natural intelligence will not get <laughs> copied by artificial intelligence so remember yeah. that you know yeah any more questions one good afternoon it, it was uh, indeed very informative session dialog my question is uh, what is your law what is your vision for india in the next decade i mean the world uh, the world entrepreneurship is buzzing all around and we are as we were job seekers and now we are becoming job job givers so where do you see india in the next 10 years my vision is sone ki veet chidiya version 2.0 <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh hello sir firstly thank you so much for this amazing discussion i would just like to know ki uh, we know that nowadays many tech giants and uh, are setting up their businesses in india be it be like it services or uh, their manufacturing so what are the new policy changes that india should do or nascom that uh, like you suggest india to do 
uh, should there be more leisure or restrictions in the policies for further growth in IT sector? Also, uh, one more link question to this. Uh, let you have said in your one of your stories that initially you were also scared that many companies, uh, many MNCs would come and take our human capital. So, how would we keep a balance supporting Indian origin companies? or startups and also allowing and gaining trust of foreign companies. So that's my question. We believe very strongly to compete with the best in the world. So you build around that. I mean, not to be scared of anyone. You, you be smart enough to understand what your limitations are, what your capabilities are, and then you plan it. Nothing can stop today, at least I believe very strongly any Indian company to do what they want to do. The future is, I mean, they just have to jump in, use this lost, what you learn in the schools, colleges, MBA, whatever, all that, can use that knowledge base, people around you. Enough knowledge data is available for you to take the right decision. Are you done with 10 questions? Yes, I am the 10th question person here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'll keep the book on behalf of Vasit itself so that we can circulate to it to each and everyone. Other copies are going to go individuals, so that's a plan. Um, uh, sir, before I you know, ask, here's a question, you know, uh, what are your top three picks in IT and not in IT? If you are supposed to be a startup person today, both of you, sir, like how would you, what, what are your top three domains if you are supposed to start a business today? In IT, like within IT and not in IT, if you want to comment on that. That will be really insightful for all of us. I mean, AI, quantum computing, uh, and robotics. Okay. Vijay, sir, yours? <laughs> if I were to pick the domain aspect. Yeah, within IT. So, yeah. healthcare. Okay. Second is, I think, uh, clean tech. Clean technology. I think there's a lot of demand in, you know, green energy. There's, there's a lot of demand. And clearly, I think the third one comes from the fact that, you know, with, I mean, I would say fintech, but fintech has evolved so much that even today, uh, with UPI being here, I mean, UPI has, of course, created revolution, not just in India, even outside. But there is still a lot of reach that needs to happen with masses. We, are, we have crossed a big hurdle with UPI. But I think the revolution to, for the fintech to really impact, I think, is still to be seen. And I, we have crossed a big hurdle, but I think there's, there's a lot more that can happen. So fintech would be the third. Uh, that question was, I think, most be, mostly we have of all, on all the students. With this, uh, I'd like to... Sure. Yeah, yeah, one more question. Yes, Principal, yes. madam, here. Pass on the mic. Mike. We have undergone some personal and professional dilemmas, too. So some traits helped you to overcome all of this. Could you please explain to everyone for this knowledge? What are the traits which Anekan Vaad, Sikhar, all those things, could you please explain once again? First one is that I is it loud? First one, very profound statement which I don't know how deeply I believe, but I do try to believe, that Earth will keep rotating without you and me. So not to carry any challenge, any opportunity, any stress on your head beyond a point. So if it happens, it happens. That's a, so start from that perspective. Hopefully that keeps me on my underground in terms of whatever I do. In the book, I've talked about some of the uh, values. Uh, one is Anekantwad. And it's a... And I don't give credit, I mean, it's, what do you call it? It's a Jainism where it promotes Anekantwa. But I call it more, it's a spiritual law, the law of humanity. It's not just restricted to uh, Jainism. Similarly, Aparigra or uh, uh, Swikar. Now, Anekantwa, again, tells you that truth has, there's no such thing as absolute truth. It depends on from where you are uh, seeing it from. So that helps you to look at the situation always from the multiple angles. So what particular suggestion comes up and you are somebody is arguing, you try to understand his or her perspective also. 
and then you can arrive at a, you were asking about compromise uh, but not a compromise but you come to a common solution so anekant vaad helps tremendously in terms of uh, solving a problem if you look at aparigra aparigra means not attachment now at no attachment again means don't be judgmental you give what you want to give don't expect anything in return now it's a hard one okay, because you feel i am doing nascom we did all this but i don't expect anything nascom to give me or anything what i do i try my best i do what i like to do i enjoy doing it i am not even saying giving back to society i'm doing it because i enjoy doing it period that, that again helps me to keep up a large number of issues which people face now yeah in the process you may not become a celebrity or a hero or whatever that can happen if you keep pushing yourself uh, beyond a point but that's your call at that point how far you want to uh, do it and swikar is a very i mean we all go through in life so many adversities death in the family some serious disease uh two business challenges regulations change not your fault but regulations change and suddenly you are out of so all such challenges how do you accept and move on so that's again swikar helps you to accept it the reality the way it is and then move on now not easy some of these principles but i think more you keep practicing it it becomes part of your uh, way of doing i hope i explained <laughs> Yes, it allows you to keep India first. When some of those things come very easily, then. Um, with this, I'd like to propose the vote of thanks, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Harish sir. Uh, I really would put. Uh, I don't have words for what I have learned today. However, uh, I'll put it in uh, teacher's way. I teach software engineering for quite a number of years now. Three days back, I happened to give this example to the students that I have a young man, you know, who's two. And if I give him a two thousand rupees note, he does not know the value of it. He might tear it out. So uh, what I was teaching was that goal to the students at that point of time. And what you have taught us today is exactly the same goal. Some of us may not be knowing the value, and you know, being young one, we might have done some, something which might have uh, maybe disheartened something. But uh, gold, I'm li literally getting goosebumps right now when I'm saying this. Gold is what we have got today. Some of us might not know the value of it, but down the line they'll learn. I'm pretty sure on this. So thank you so much, sir, for so much of our knowledge. Uh, Vijay sir, thank you, sir, for.